inclusion of the Lorraine Loomis Act, which while I largely agree with the intent, um, we have not seen it. I've not seen the, the uh, it has not been filed. Is that correct, Don? Uh, yeah, I believe that's correct. I haven't seen it yet. Okay. throw my support behind it fully, uh, both Um, we, we are really worried about that here and still are at Elwha and it's There was going to be no more logging and the sky was going to fall and life as we know. The hearing deaf interpreter, I think you're on the main screen. We want the governor to be on the main screen if possible.
today about our efforts to keep people safe uh, when it comes to testing and vaccine and masks. We also want to talk about our continued expectation and commitment to keep our schools open for our children. Uh, first, uh, uh, some comments about where we stand regarding the pandemic. Obviously, we know we are experiencing a, a very dramatic rise in COVID cases due to the Omicron variant. In the past a week, we've seen about 140, 146% increase in our numbers of infections uh, and a 46% increase in daily COVID hospital admissions. Obviously, that's concerning because our hospitals are already uh, very taxed. Uh, we are seeing more COVID cases now than at any point during the entire pandemic. And our hospitalizations are nearing the peak of the hospitalizations that we experienced during the Delta portion of this pandemic. Now, we know why this is. Um, Omicron is very contagious, much more contagious than the Delta uh, variant, and it is rapidly overtaking the Delta variant already in, uh, in the infections in the state of Washington, as well as nationally. We also know that because uh, increasing numbers of people will become uh, ill, we're likely to see some, uh, uh, we hope, temporary disruptions in some of our systems and services in the state. I hope that is not the case, but it's certainly something we've got to be prepared for. So I think in the light of that situation, now is the time to redouble our efforts against this uh, virus. The tools we have used uh, thus far are still effective, thankfully. Wearing a mask, getting vaccinated, and getting boosted, uh, uh, avoiding unnecessary large gatherings inside, particularly where we can. Uh, these are things that still work, but on all of those cases, we think we can up our game. We can uh, use more effective masking. We can improve our uh, access to testing. We can get more people boosted. And all of those are things that we can do uh, starting today. That's what we wanted to talk about. So we wanted to uh, just start thinking about, uh, for instance, masking. Uh, given how contagious this new Omicron is, uh, our health professionals believe that it is important to try to use the most effective mask that we can. Now, the mask that is most effective, of course, is the one that we wear. But if we are gonna wear a mask, using one that is more effective, perhaps, than just the cotton mask we might have used are things we think can help, which includes a KN95 or, or double masking, uh, particularly using a surgical mask. All of these things can help protect you and your family. Wearing a mask is good. Wearing a better mask is better. And we are hopeful people can consider that in their daily operations. Now, we know our hospitals are already near capacity. And we have serious concerns about our hospitals becoming overwhelmed. So we are asking everyone to take these common sense precautions. Uh, we ask that you seek care from your primary care clinic rather than going to hospitals with non-urgent conditions. This will help everybody. Uh, and in the face of this variant, we know we're taking several immediate actions to help our communities cope. Let's talk first about expanding testing. Our administration has been working tirelessly to acquire additional rapid tests that can be done at home so that individuals will have better access for a variety of pur uh, purposes. We have some good news. Our Department of Health has procured and has on uh, very short-term expectations of delivery 5.5 million additional rapid tests to be available to Washingtonians in a variety of ways. We have on hand today 800,000 of these tests uh, we expect uh, 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 another 2 million by Friday and another 2 million in the following week to be delivered. And those are orders where manufacturers have told us that they will deliver us in those time periods. So we'll have 5.5 million tests available to add to uh, what Washingtonians have of these rapid, convenient at-home tests that will be available. Uh, to ensure equitable access, uh, we plan on making these tests available in multiple ways. Uh, this is going to include sending 1 million of these additional tests to schools as they request them on top of the ones they already have had access to 
uh, both from the start of the state and from the direct purchases. And of course, we've provided billions of dollars, or millions of dollars, excuse me, to, uh, to schools for this purpose. So this would be on top of the, the uh, testing supplies that the schools already have on hand. In addition, we will distribute an additional 1 million tests to uh, local health organizations to be available to communities. Now, to help with distribution of the others, we've partnered with Care Evolution and Amazon to expand our testing infrastructure and create a web portal for families to use that will allow you to go to this portal and directly order these tests for delivery to your home. We will be putting 3.5 million of those tests we've ordered toward that effort. We want to thank particularly Amazon for them for helping us in the distribution mechanism for this. We hope to have that portal open around the middle of January, and I want to thank everybody uh, uh, for those efforts. This would be on top of the federal portal. So as you know, the federal government has will be opening a portal for direct distribution of rapid tests as well. And this, what we are doing will be uh, in addition to the, that federal portal. Uh, in addition, uh, today the White House uh, uh, advisor Jeff uh, Zients announced that we will be receiving a FEMA uh, uh, testing facility of a high throughput. And I want to thank our federal partners in working through our Department of Health and FEMA to make that a possibility. We don't have the dates for location of that, but we're looking forward to expanding testing capability. And, and that'll probably be a high throughput one uh, in the hundreds and or, or thousands. So we appreciate that effort. Now, in addition to testing, obviously, we want to continue our vaccination efforts. We have a lot of work to do there because we have a lot of Washingtonians that are at risk today from this Omicron variant and Delta still, that we really uh, can protect themselves through the vaccine. In treating our, our holiday message, we, uh, we talked about the fact that we are increasing our capacity in our local mass vaccination site. We've gone from 500 to uh, 1,500 capacity, and even above that, that site is now located in Auburn. And uh, so that was an increased capacity uh, from a couple of weeks ago. We're really happy about that increased capacity. We have also uh, have eight additional community health clinics that our Department of Health has stood up. And the joint capacity of those are about an additional capacity of 2,000 additional vaccinations a, a day. Now, there are open appointments for these available this week, including today. And so we encourage people to seek them out. And one of the best ways to do that is through the Department of Health's vaccine locator page at doh.wa.gov forward slash vaccine locator. And you can also book an appointment by calling 1-833-VAX-AHELP. On top of these efforts, we will also be adding another high throughput site. That'll be in Northwest Washington. We're still picking the exact site. Uh, that'll come online hopefully during the week of January 18th. And uh, that will be a high throughput site uh, in excess of 500 vaccinations a day. Uh, we'll also have some additional National Guard personnel helping increase our booster delivery capacity at different sites. So we're very pleased to increase our capacity for administering these doses. Now, it's one thing to have capacity, but we want to get shots in arms. So we need people to come in and get them. So uh, we know it's really important for people to get vaccinated. It has been since the beginning of this pandemic. And it's now particularly important for people who have had the, the first two doses to get the booster dose. Because the booster dose, particularly with the onset of the Omicron variety, is of particular importance. It has broader benefits than just the first two doses. It has more consistent results and more term, more long-term immunity compared to natural immunity. This is important. Getting the booster, you will be in better odds of staying out of the hospital than just having had COVID. So it has significant benefits. In fact, if you've already had the first two doses, you'll have a significant greater chance, something in the order of 80% of avoiding serious illness or death. 
So getting a booster is extremely important for folks. It's a blessing to have. We hope more, more people will avail themselves of this opportunity. As we talked about earlier, uh, having as protective a mask as we can is, is one of the best, most important tools in our fight, obviously. We need to up our game because of the transmissibility of the Omicron variant. We know that, uh, that there are certain masks that are much more effective than others. You get significant more protection from a KN95 or an N95 or by layering masks, cloth on top of surgical masks or surgical masks. Those are better in significant ways than, than a cloth mask. So uh, for this reason, we intend to release about 10 million masks of uh, different varieties uh, in our state supply in the, in the, in the sh short term. And that'll be released to schools and to local communities and, and community clinics and like in the upcoming weeks. These people will be able to access these by going to your local center, to your school, your local community clinic, uh, or the like. And obviously it's important for the schools to the extent schools request these supplies on top of what they've already been given. We wanna make sure that uh, keeping the schools open remains our paramount obligation here. So we'll use the state, both the local and state emergency management distribution channels, local health departments, as well as our K through 12 infrastructure to make these available. And so we really hope people will consider uh, becoming a little more ambitious uh, when it comes to masking. Well, like I, if I can talk about the paramount duty of the state, that's the education of our children. Uh, it is our firm and stalwart expectation that we will keep our schools open. Uh, we believe we have the tools available to provide safety for our students, and we are committed to doing everything we can to use these tools so we can keep our schools open in the upcoming months. And we certainly want to minimize any disruption, and there may be some di disruption in a classroom in the future, but we want to minimize those so that we can keep our schools open. The reason for this is, is, is obvious. Uh, In-school uh, education is, is more effective, and we've had too much learning opportunity loss already. We don't want to, to continue learning loss. It has had some inequity as well associated with it. So this is why we are focused so intensely on increasing supplies of masks and tests and the use of boosters to make those available to our staff and students. And I would like to reiterate uh, our state's gratitude for how educators, the whole educational community, bus drivers, uh, cooks, custodial, teachers, counselors, superintendents, principals, they've all been working really, really hard for our students. And we're gonna stand by them to keep these schools open uh, in a safe way. And I look forward to success in that regard. <clears throat> in addition, uh, in the upcoming days, the Department of Health will publish updated K-12 school guidance that includes an expansion of our Learn to Return program. Now, this Learn to Return program has been considerably successful. Over 90% of our students are enrolled in schools that are already participating in this program so that we can give schools the testing capability to rapidly respond if there is a, a child with COVID. So instead of having to shut the school down, you can uh, identify uh, other students so they don't have to be in, in quarantine and we can prevent the spread. So we're gonna expand that in a variety of ways. And I wanna thank the educators who are working with us on this project. So we're gonna continue to monitor our healthcare system as the key metric on how we continue to navigate this surge. We know the next uh, few weeks will be difficult. We expect to see our hospitals become busier. We may see staffing shortages of essential workforce in a variety of our industries. Uh, this may involve some frustrating days for us uh, because of some staffing shortages. And I know that Washingtonians are gonna be resilient through this and undeterred in our commitment uh, to continue our efforts. Obviously, I don't have a crystal ball about the days to come, but I do believe there is reason to have hope 
that we will weather this storm because we have the tools available to us to protect ourselves, increase our protection. Booster shots, masks, common sense, helping schools reduce the threat of this pandemic. These are all things that are within uh, our power. In addition, there's some evidence from other countries where this pandemic has gone up very rapidly and ours is, is going up rapidly and will continue for some time to go up rapidly. But there is some evidence it could come down quite rapidly as well. So let's be confident in our ability to provide additional protection to ourselves and our loved ones and continue uh, this effort. And uh, I'm looking forward to working with everyone to do that. And I'm glad we're going to be able to do the state's part. This is something we're all going to pull together on. Businesses, family members, federal government, mayors, county, uh, county executives, we all got to pull together here. And I'm glad we're doing our part in our state to help out. And again, I want to thank all the people who are working so hard on this. Look, our healthcare workers, the overtime that our, our nurses and our doctors and our custodial staff and hospitals has been absolutely extraordinary. And they're going to be taxed in the upcoming weeks. And we thank them for that. But of course, they're not alone. Uh, bus drivers, snowplow drivers, people are working overtime really hard through this. And I'd like to say that's going to end tomorrow. But there is a reason we can be better, and we're providing the tools for Washingtonians uh, to do just that. Uh, so today we also have Lacey uh, Fernback and Nick Struley to help to answer any questions you may have. And with that, you may fire when ready, Gridley. Okay, first we'll go to Rachel with AP. Go ahead, Rachel. Hi, good afternoon. This question may be for either the governor or Lacey. But which manufacturers are these tests coming from, and what's the total cost to the state? Also, how will someone qualify for a test? Clearly, this covers much, but not all of the population. Lacey, do you want to uh, take those? Uh, yeah, we are working with multiple manufacturers to procure tests uh, because the, the supply chain is constrained. Um, so it's multiple uh, vendors, uh, you know, and currently we're estimating about $50 million to get these 5.5 million tests into Washington state. As far as eligibility, the portal will be open to all Washingtonians, if I'm correct, Lacey, on this. So the portal will be available. Uh, the distribution network through the schools will be for the students and the staff of those schools. Um, which is a good thing. Now, by the way, Lacey, remind me, I, don't, I can't remember if we made this decision. Will we allow the schools to be also distributing to the broader community in addition to schools? I'm trying to recall where we came down on this. Yes, so the portal, and we'll have more information on this in the coming days. Again, we expect to launch mid-month here in January. Uh, so that will be available to the public. And then for uh, tests that are going to schools or local public health or community-based organizations for distribution uh, to their community, including their school. In the case of the school, uh, there's an ordering process set up with the Department of Health. Um, schools enrolled in Learn to Return or our local health partners can submit their requests and uh, distribute these out to their community as best needed, whether that is for um, people living homeless, people with low incomes, people who may not have access to uh, the website for um, technology reasons. Um, however, locals best need to do um, to reach people in their community, we want them to be able to do that. And is there a goal for um, a weekly uh, tests for months out? Because obviously um, people will be interested in this. And are you expecting that the federal government will help supplement the, the state? portion, but are you going to continue to have a weekly sort of allotment that you're going to be ordering from these manufacturers going forth? Yes, we will continue our efforts to expand this procurement pipeline uh, in the at least the weeks to come. Now, what we're doing is on top of the federal government. Both will, will be operative. We won't reduce our, our efforts just because the federal government is also having a pipeline. They will not reduce theirs because we have a pipeline. We'll, we'll do both to expand uh, the testing availability as much as we can. Okay, up next, we'll go to Joe with the Seattle Times. Go ahead, Joe.
You muted, Joe? So I'll make sure to unmute. Okay, maybe we'll come back to Joe. Next, we'll go to Laurel with the spokesman review. Go ahead, Laurel. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, two questions. Um, on the testing, what is the advice right now for finding at-home tests if this portal isn't going to be up until the next uh, two weeks or so? And then on the masking, um, can you just elaborate a little bit about how you're giving these masks to local communities? Like if I wanted to get a KN95 right now, should I go, or not right now, but when those are delivered, should I go to my local health department to do that? Well, I would suggest all of the opportunities that are available, and that's we've, we, we're using multiple distribution systems, and all of them, I would suggest, <laughs> all of them <laughs> are ones to go to. None is better than others. Uh, you know, right now in masks, they can be purchased individually you know, through Amazon. Today, you can go buy masks today, and, and there is availability, but we want to make sure there's availability. That's where we're releasing this huge stock of uh, because we have them on stock today, but they're also available even maybe faster <laughs> than we can get the stock out. So I would just suggest all of the the pipelines that we've talked about today are all good. And um, there was a second part of your question, which I can't recall. Um, on uh, the at-home test, just wondering your advice right now for finding an at-home test if this portal isn't going to be up for the next couple of weeks. Well, there are multiple places to purchase them from pharmacies to Amazon to other online, online dealers. Those are probably the most rapid way to acquire them. In schools, there are schools that do have some stock on hand and mask as well for their staff and students. And if you have a student, that might be a good way uh, to check it out. I, I, but I believe there are multiple ways even today to, to acquire them. I think the most important message is the desire to do so. And we hope people will exercise that. Lacey, do you want to add anything? Yeah. I can add a little on at home tests. We know that the, the demand on the in the public market is really uh, high for these. Um, so meaning they show up in pharmacies and immediately fall, you know, are flying off the shelves or uh, when you order them, it takes about a week to get them. So our advice to the public, uh, if you're purchasing an at home test is to think of it like band-aids uh, in your medicine cabinet. You don't go buy a Band-Aid when you cut yourself uh, chopping vegetables in the kitchen. You have them on hand. So um, if order now, plan ahead, order now so that you have your tests next week or later in the month when you need them. Uh, certainly our team is working as fast as we can with Amazon and Care Evolution to uh, get the portal up. And also the really important thing, we have to get the tests into the state. As you heard, they're coming this week and next week from the governor. Uh, in your question to the masks, so like um, the way we allocate tests to local public health, we have throughout the pandemic allocated um, and distributed masks to uh, local communities. And those requests come to us, they either come to the State Emergency Operations Center or to Department of Health uh, through local emergency management and public health agencies. And then they in turn can work with partners at the local level, community-based organizations, um, health facilities, schools, et cetera, to get uh, masks or other supplies out to communities and community members who need them. Uh, as the governor mentioned, for adult sizes and, and even now children sizes, there are uh, pretty broad supplies of masks online. Um, there's a, a site called Project N95, and then um, you know online vendors like Amazon and others that sell uh, KN95, KF94 masks, um, as well as surgical masks. Okay, we're going to go back and try Joe with the Seattle Times one more time. Go ahead, Joe. Joe, are you there? Okay, we might come back to him later. We'll go to Austin, the Northwest News Network. Go ahead, Austin. Uh, thank you. Um, Governor, just a question about why you don't feel the need right now to press the pause button on any of what might be considered higher risk activities or gatherings in the state. Well, um, that's a very important question. I'm glad you, you asked that. Uh, we believe that there is the the uh, 
because of the nature of this virus and our increasing tools that are now available to us and our increasing understanding of its science, we believe it is a reasonable thing to do to use these tools that are now available to us and that that is the most reasonable approach to the current status that we are in. We now have vaccines that are available to, to dramatically reduce the, race, uh, the uh, risk of serious illness and death. These vaccines are miracles. They're miracles of modern science, and they are extremely successful in keeping you from having serious illness. And we now have those vaccines available universally for free. So that now that we have these tools available to us, we believe relying upon them is one approach that we should do. Secondly, we have a variant that although is extremely contagious, all the evidence suggests it is probably significantly less risky as a percentage of infections that end up in hospitalization or death. That is something we take into consideration. Third, we have multiple, uh, what I call common sense measures now available to us, including masks, which are now we've made broadly available to people free. Uh, we have rapid testing that is available, and we have scientific knowledge about the risk that people will make self-assessments about the risk environments that they have. And the people who have not been vaccinated have had plenty of opportunities to get vaccinated. You have had months and months and months. So if you have not availed yourself of that, you've made a decision to accept that risk. And unfortunately, we've lost too many of our citizens who made that decision. Uh, and we believe that we have been successful to date keeping our economy thriving throughout this by doing these reasonable measures. And I'm very excited. Our economy is, our unemployment rate's about as low as it's ever been. And we believe we want to continue that and not have the economic disruptions that we had to have earlier on in this pandemic. Look, we, it is painful when people are out of work. It's painful when business shut down. It's painful when people can't enjoy the things that they enjoy. So for all those reasons, we think that, uh, that this is the right approach. And it's also consistent, and I want to come back to this, is, is our paramount duty is education of our children. And we think this approach, starting with keeping our schools open, is consistent with the approach of using these tools that are now available to us, as opposed to denying ourselves the things that we want to have in our in our lives, good education for our children, a good economy, we think we can have both of those. Just briefly, maybe this is a question for Lacey. Given that people are getting exposure notifications on their phone left and right now, and that tests are still hard to come by, most of us have probably been exposed in one way or another, and we're trying to decide, can we go into the office? Can we send our kids to school? What's the general guideline if somebody is asymptomatic but may have been come into contact with somebody or may have been exposed. Is it still okay to proceed with normal activities until and unless you find out you're positive or have symptoms, or do you have to lock down and isolate until you find out for sure? Uh, thanks for the question. So this, and this is a good question. CDC recently updated the guidance for isolation and quarantine. So the, um, if you're exposed or potentially exposed, meaning you get a notification, uh, the guidance is if you are if you are up to date on your vaccines, including if you've been boosted as an adult, uh, you do not have to quarantine. You could go about your daily living, but you should wear a well-fitting uh, quality mask and avoid, you know, to the degree you can, avoid being around immunocompromised people. Um, if you are not up to date on your vaccine, so you're not vaccinated as an adult and not, not boosted as an adult or not vaccinated as a child, then you do need to uh, stay home for five days. Uh, so quarantine at home for five days. And then um, it is recommended if before you leave that quarantine period early that if you can, you get a test um, and continue, of course, to wear a mask. If I may uh, add to that, look, um, it is true that the, the evidence is strongly suggestive that Omicron is a less 
less frequent fatalities associated with Omicron than Delta. Uh, some evidence is from the UK this morning says maybe it's 60 percent less likely to end up in a hospital. But because it is so contagious, uh, you could end up being very, very ill. And if you talk to people that have had breakthrough cases, you get very, very ill, and you have some benefit avoiding that. And in addition, it's very important to the community to keep you out of the hospital. So exercising some common sense and caution on this is appropriate. And we depend on people exercising both of those things. Maybe there's one party you just don't go to for a week or two. Kind of a small price to pay sometimes on what we hope to be is, you know, certainly not a permanent condition. So we hope people will use that, that judgment and get their boosters. Because whatever you do, getting the booster is going to put you in a lot better position. All right, we're going to try Joe one more time. If we can't hear him, I have his questions to ask. Go ahead, Joe. Okay, so qu two quick questions, either for Lacey or the governor. One, any opportunity for state residents to pick up the tests anywhere, or will they only be available on the forthcoming website? No, they'll be available multiple places. First off, you have the portal where you get shipped through Amazon right to your home. Uh, you will also have uh, availability through the other mechanisms in local health districts, in schools, and local health clinics. And you can go pick them up at those locations. And basically, those enterprises will place orders with our Department of Health. They will be shipped to those locations, and then people can go pick them up. So there'll be multiple ways, either direct shipment or you can pick them up at these uh, these locations. And we did it that way because, we, you know, people live their lives differently, and we wanted to have equity for people that may not, you know, have access online. or So we wanted to give people multiple opportunities. All right, and that second quick question was, can Lacey or the governor share what they're expecting in terms of hospitalization slash ICU search, given what they're seeing with caseloads and workforce shortages? Well, I'll, do, I'll give you my opinion. The Lacey's probably more important. Look, our hospitalizations are going to go up uh, almost inevitably. They are going up. As I've indicated, we've had about a 45% increase just in the recent week or two. And that's going to continue for some period of time, given the exponential rise of, of this. That's almost inevitable. We want to tamp it down as much as humanly possible. And then we're hoping we're going to get to a peak, as some of these other countries have. But we all have a capability to do something about that. And just slowing this thing, even slowing this down so that our hospitals do not become overwhelmed is really, really a value. So if you're getting a booster, you're just not helping yourself. You're helping everybody in your community. You're helping your neighbor who has a heart attack who can now get into the hospital or a neighbor gets in a car wreck or a neighbor wants a new hip. You know, uh, it, it may be necessary to cancel some elective surgery because of this. It's already happened at one of our major institutions. So when you get the booster, you're helping yourself, but you also happen to everybody else in the community so that they can get access uh, to health care. You want to add anything, Lacey? Yeah, no, I think the governor covered this really well. Our healthcare system statewide is in a place of extreme strain and, and it has been for months, like uh, leading up to, during, and in follow up to the Delta wave. And then we have added on this spike in cases. Uh, so it's going to be a really challenging few weeks ahead for our partners in the healthcare system. And we're certainly going to do what we can um, to support them. Uh, we also, I want to reiterate the governor's um, important point about using the emergency room only for urgent care. So if you feel like your life is in jeopardy, of course, go to the emergency room. But please, if you have um, a mild injury or illness uh, or, you know, that you can manage at home, do so. Um, try to use primary care or urgent care in place of the emergency department. And really importantly, um, please don't go to an ER to get a COVID test. We have heard some reports of uh, people seeking either confirmatory tests after doing an at-home test or going to the ER to get a test, um, in particular when the weather was bad and some of the test sites were closed. So um, please use the ER if you need it for emergent care and otherwise um, uh, get your health care in the primary care system. 
You know, when you think about this too, I hope people think of a hospital as not just some kind of faceless institution. Just imagine, think of that nurse has been working for, you know, double overtime for a year and a half with kids at home. These people have been heroic for us. Give them a hand, you know? I mean, you give a friend a hand. I was listening to Senator Tim Keating. Keating, he was trapped in the interstate in Virginia in the ice storm for 27 hours. And he talked about how people just helped each other. Somebody gave him an orange. Another person gave him a blanket. Help somebody. I help a nurse today. Get a booster. Okay, up next, we will go to Jerry with the Everett Herald. Go ahead, Jerry. Governor, two questions related to what you've said earlier about what we should be expecting in the next couple of weeks. First, um, on the public services, could you discuss what public services you think will be disrupted by uh, staffing shortages and so forth? And then, and what are the responses your administration is putting together? And then secondly, on the hospitals, um, is your administration begun conversations about issuing a critical care designation or declaration? Uh, that would not only allow patients to be moved, but might involve life and death decisions? Well, there's nothing imminent as far as any sort of statewide critical care designation, but we're always talking to the hospitals that that could become a possibility in our state. We have had discussions with hospitals about when it will be, become appropriate to stop doing elective surgeries and do necessary work. That's an ongoing discussion. We're not there today, but we might in the near future, given these numbers. Um, and we just have to be realistic that that's possible in other states are already looking at and already there in that position who are quote ahead of us on this curve. So those are daily discussions uh, with the hospitals. And as I've indicated, one of the major hospital chains is already a curtailed elective surgery so that we can make staff available uh, for necessary uh, operations, including COVID. As far as the staffing shortages, every system is subject to potentially being understaffed in the upcoming weeks. Certainly, we've seen thousands of airlines have to cancel flights because of staffing shortages. Uh, uh, transportation companies have been short of truck drivers and the like. Uh, we've had challenges with snowplow drivers. The healthcare system has had some increasing absences. Uh, New York City has seen 10, 15% of their workforce and some of their enterprises off because they're ill with COVID. So every system has some potential challenges now, and every system is trying to get ready for that. We're trying to make the systems as efficient as possible. We're trying to recruit people as much as possible. We're asking people to work overtime as sometimes as much as they can bear. So we're doing everything uh, we can. But there are some limits. And I, I, I guess what I'm saying is, is that given the nature and the explosive nature of this variant, uh, we just cannot be shocked if there's some service delivery and we have some frustration in our lives. I think all of us, in some sense, will have a taste of that. But we're just going to work through that. That's what we do. And we're going to get through this. And there's going to be another side of this curve, I believe. And we can make it sooner by doing all the things we talked about today. All right, up next, we will go to Shauna with McClatchy. Go ahead, Shauna. Good afternoon. Uh, my question applies to the testing kits. I was curious how long, um, once the web portal's open, how long will it take um, those tests to be sent out once people order them online? Lisa, do you know the answer to that? I, um, I think we'll have more details on that in the days ahead. Um, I also just want to make sure something else is clear because there were questions earlier about distribution at the local level and, you know, a reminder um, that we're announcing based on things that we've ordered. So, you know, we don't want the public to show up at their local health department today or tomorrow asking for tests. Um, typically, the local health department, if they get these tests, they're going to be distributing them um, through mechanisms like community-based organizations, or um, they might be handing them out at homeless shelters. They could possibly distribute them at their own test sites. So stay tuned for more details to come. All of this is unfolding very quickly. I guess the, the advice would be check the website of the organization, see what they have to say to see if they have availabilities. 
That's what I would suggest. All right, up next, we'll go with Drew from King 5. Go ahead, Drew. Good afternoon, Governor. If keeping schools open is a priority and you know the benefits of the boosters and vaccinations, have you thought about mandating boosters for teachers and what about vaccinating students for public schools? Uh, we have thought about both of those things. Uh, uh, we have not decided to go that route, certainly at this moment. Uh, there's obviously some benefits of that because we found our mandatory vaccination was very successful for our employees in healthcare and education and state employees. We increased the vaccination rate dramatically and had minimal loss, thankfully, of hardworking people. So yes, that is something we have thought about. Uh, we there's nothing imminent to move in that direction. We just hope people will, as as it's easier to get boosters, it is our hope that more people will come in to get them without the necessity of a mandate. And we think matching the supply, which we are increasing now, that demand will also increase and those will be a perfect match. So we're watching that. We hope that that will be the case because we just hate to lose people's lives, hardworking people. And as I've indicated, I've gone to too many funerals. Of, of people in state service, uh, you know, from prison guards to legislators. It's, it's just a tragedy when this happens. So we hope that that improves. On the school and the mandate for students, uh, the, the state um, uh, health uh, commission is looking at whether or not uh, this should be added to the list of required vaccinations as we now have vaccinations for any number of other vaccinations. They have a, a group of physicians that are looking at this. We have nothing imminent to announce on that. There is a concern on that. It, it, it may seem absolutely a no brainer to do this given the fact that we're in a pandemic and this vaccine really works. But we are concerned if we ended up losing students who wouldn't come to school because of that, and we're not unmindful of that because there is a significant percentage, unfortunately, in our state who have been listening to false information and we're concerned wouldn't have their kids in school as a result of that. So that's something that is also a part of our thought process. All right, up next, we'll go with Keith from Como. Go ahead, Keith. Yeah, I'm at a uh, uh, testing site in uh, Pierce County. It's full, two hour wait. Uh, they're gonna have to close early. Same thing I was down in Thurston County. Uh, what are you doing? I know you're talking about the at-home kits that are coming in the future, but what are you doing today to get the mass testing sites expanded uh, and also increasing uh, the state vaccination, excuse me, uh, the state testing sites uh, because people are getting a lot of exposure notices and uh, getting uh, COVID and they need to be tested. What are you doing for that? Well, I'd like to say that I'm ordering it to stop snowing because that has been a problem, unfortunately, for some of these sites. I hope we're over that in a while, although I still love the snow. Well, listen, we just talked about the things to expand these sites, and we have done some. Uh, we just talked about expanding uh, access to the home delivery, uh, and that will be available 3.5 million uh, uh, test kits will be available directly, free, no charge, to your home. That's a pretty good deal. We'll also have uh, uh, a million available through schools and a million uh, available through community uh, centers. We have an additional federal testing site, which we're uh, very excited about. And we don't have the exact number on that, but that's in the hundreds or multiple thousands, so we're excited about that. Um, so we're doing a lot, and we will continue to expand these efforts, and we hope people uh, will use them. But I would say, and I, I, I don't think this should be forgotten, we have the capability to protect ourselves sometimes even without a test. You know, if this means that you don't go to a party where you're not wearing a mask right now, and you can't get a test, you wish you could get one, you know, maybe you don't go to the party that week. I mean, these are things that we can protect ourselves at. So we'll continue our, our effort to improve testing access. I'm really glad about the 500 million that the federal government will also provide to their own online portals. So we will have rapid availability. And I wanna reiterate, we're not done. We're continuing to increase our 
orders. We have a good line to some additional on top of this 5.5 million. I'm not announcing it today because they're not absolutely firm, but we have good uh, a good lead from additional ones as well. Did Lacey have something to add? Lacey, did you want to add anything? Um, I, I was going to jump in on the uh, the request for the FEMA site. Um, the other thing, you know, I just want to note is we're regularly working with local public health to monitor access to testing. And the governor alluded to this briefly in his remarks, but beyond the things he just summarized, we do have additional mobile teams that help with both vaccination and uh, testing. And um, if local public health needs additional support for testing capacity, um, we are here to help them with that, as well as providing supplies to testing partners across the state. Up next, we'll go to Hannah with Cairo Radio. Go ahead, Hannah. Hi, just a couple of quick ones. Uh, one, I'm hearing from medical doctors working in some of our larger hospitals in the state who are parents and concerned about schools not being paused uh, as we come out of the winter holiday break because they believe that it will add to the rapid spread of COVID and what they're seeing in their own workplaces as far as capacity and strain on the system. Is that anything that you can speak to? And also, can anyone speak to what we are seeing specifically with young people in Omicron in Washington State? Lisa, you want to talk about the youth experience? Yes. Um, so we're seeing disease increasing across all age groups. And you heard the governor mention that this is a, a highly transmissible variant. Um, we had a number of uh, youth-related outbreaks um, primarily related to high contact indoor sports over the winter break. However, I want to remind people um, what we do know about COVID in schools and um, and reiterate the governor's point, points that he previously made uh, that we have measures to protect ourselves. So in schools in particular, we have uh, required layered health and safety measures. The schools work so hard on implementing these and helping students to follow them. Masks, uh, distance to the degree possible, um, good ventilation, uh, spending more time outdoors, good hand hygiene, uh, and, and certainly being ready to respond when there is a case with things like testing and uh, contact tracing. Those things slow spread in, in schools and they helped us keep schools open for the most part uh, during the Delta surge. We had very few classrooms and, and schools that had to close during that surge. Um, we uh, have confidence that those measures will also help us slow transmission in schools as we work through this Omicron wave. Um, the other thing, you know, for parents, a reminder to uh, encourage your kid to wear their mask and keep their mouth uh, and nose fully covered. Uh, and that's in school and any sort of public environment. Uh, and a really important reminder that there are huge health benefits um, in addition to the learning that happens uh, in person in schools. And I, I have two school age children. They're in public school and uh, they are they are fully vaccinated now. They are in the latest group to become eligible and they got vaccinated in November and December. And that is another very strong protection uh, that parent a protective step that parents can take. So if you have not got your child vaccinated, please talk to your, your pediatric provider, get your questions answered. Um, get their appointment scheduled, uh, and then um, make sure you have masks on hand, and um, hopefully it will be not a disruptive January for your family. Yeah, I want to add, just from the historical context, we did not have these tools available to families to protect their children when we had to close down uh, in-classroom instruction. We, now we have them, and if you're worried about your child, get them vaccinated. Get them vaccinated. Now, unfortunately, we've only got about 25, 30 percent of our younger children vaccinated, and we we're really hopeful that people increase that. By the way, I want to add something. There is so much misinformation going around. It's very disturbing to me. I heard on the radio the other day, Cairo Radio, some uh, uh, talk person saying that it's more dangerous to get the vaccine than not to. What a bunch of baloney. What a bunch of baloney. It is clear that the risk of getting this infection is worse than the extremely rare, extremely rare, you know, one in a million chance of some untoward event from this vaccine. This is 
a very safe vaccine and very helpful for, for children. So we're very hopeful people will actually use this vaccine. I also want to note there is a health downside for being out of school from a mental health perspective as well. And, you know, we've seen, unfortunately, now confirm that we've had some real mental health challenges with our children from them being isolated and not being schooled. So we've had to factor that in uh, as well. And on balance, we think that uh, that this is uh, the right approach. Next, we'll go to Joey with Puget Sound Business Journal. Go ahead, Joey. Hey. Yeah, Joey, hold on. There's one thing I got to say, too, because I always forget it. Look, it is pretty clear your child is safer wearing a mask in a classroom than sitting in a bunch of their pals watching television with no mask, eating popcorn. That's where most of these transmissions are occasioning outside of the classroom. So a classroom could be the safest place for a child, depending on what they're doing outside. Go ahead, Joey. Hi, Governor. Thanks for taking the question. Uh, you were talking about the threat that this poses to hospitals and capacity. One of the things that uh, administrators keep telling me is that there are patients in hospitals who have been treated and are ready to be discharged to adult family homes or long-term care homes, but but they can't get put into these homes because they're dealing with the same staffing shortages. They say they need the state and the Department of Health in your office to get involved to help discharge and clear up beds as more Omicron patients come in. Do you have any update on, on what you're doing to take care of that? You bet. This is a legitimate issue that we are working to help improve and have done things and will do more. Number one, we're trying to increase capacity at our long-term care facilities. And that means help them get enough uh, staff in their doors so they can increase their staffing to have more long-term beds. So in my budget, I propose dollars to increase the rates so these long-term care facilities can attract staff so they can increase their capacity. So I hope legislators will respond to my request. Uh, second, we have provided personnel to try to handle the coordination to coordinate the transfer of people out of the hospitals to our long-term care facilities. Third, we're looking at options. Uh, some of these uh, people who are of compromised uh, mental status need someone to help them figure out where they can go. We're looking at some options to try to ease that, including uh, looking at additional guardians to make them available quickly so that process can be hastened. Uh, and we've also provided additional financial assistance to the hospitals to make sure they have additional capacity as well. So this is a legitimate issue. We're working as fast as we can to help out. And I hope legislators will adopt my budget so that we can uh, ease this pipeline. Lacey, did I cover it? You, I think you covered um, nearly all of it. The other reminder is we do have the uh, staff available to hospitals, long-term care facilities, um, through our contract that uh, our federal contract with the General Services Administration um, and a vendor called ACI and uh, any facility that would like to um, avail themselves to those staffing resources over the next couple of months should reach out to the Department of Health and we can coordinate with you on the logistics of that. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Next, we'll go to Frankie with Fox 13. Go ahead, Frankie. Frankie, make sure to unmute yourself as well. All right, well, we'll come back to Frankie. Next, we'll go to Mark with Krem. Go ahead, Mark. Governor Inslee, thanks for your time. Uh, like other parts of the state, uh, we are dealing with a, a shortage of testing out here, in e or tests rather, out here in eastern Washington. We have two mass testing sites. They're run by Discovery Health, one at the fairgrounds, one at Spokane Falls Community College. The folks out there tell us they have capacity for about 500 tests per day, but they're not limited by the number of tests they have. Rather, they're limited by staffing. So is there any effort or thought to get additional staffing out here in eastern Washington so they could then increase capacity of of how many tests they can administer each day? Well, we certainly would like to hear if there's been a request by them in that regard. If, if there's a financial aspect of this, of hiring more staff, I hope that they will call Lacey and talk to her about this to see if we could supplement that, that in some way. So uh, if you can ask them or we can ask them to talk about, to explore those options, 
if that is the situation, we'd obviously like to maximize those opportunities. If we have the site and we have the, the test kits, we'd like to solve that problem. So maybe I can just direct Lacey to do some outreach and we'll look at opportunities to help out. I just volunteered you, Lacey. I know you, you're working overtime. Thank you. Okay, I don't think Frankie is on, but there's a couple of questions in the chat and then we'll wrap up. First one is from Rachel. Will people be limited to how many tests they can order slash pick up? I don't know if we thought through that. We obviously would not want people to hoard. I don't know if we had a, a technical rule on that or not. Have we addressed that yet? Um, I, I don't know if there's an official rule yet, but I wouldn't say that. Uh, we do encourage whether you're buying tests at the store or um, store pharmacy online, buy enough um, for what your family needs uh, right now and save some for your neighbors. We are dealing with a supply chain issue here nationwide uh, on these at-home tests. Uh, what I, I do also wanna remind people on the distribution um, to local partners that they really are focusing their distribution to priority populations. And so that could be for people in long-term care facilities, uh, adult family homes, it could be uh, people living in homeless shelters, people with low incomes, or people who may not be online. So our, our primary expectation for the majority of Washingtonians is that you would use that online portal once it's available. I think we might make the first kit free and the second kit $1,000. How's that, Macy? So that might help out. Okay, one more question from the chat, and then we'll go to Patrick and wrap up. First question from the chat. Will there be updates to testing frequency guidelines in schools given Omicron's increased transmissibility in asymptomatic infections? Well, we have, we think, a good protocol for that. And we've made test kits available and, and it was even indicated we'll expand that to the extent schools need it. We've just reserved 800,000 for their needs. They already have, as I've indicated, 90% of the students already are in the system. So we think we have a good protocol to provide tests for the children around a child who might be positive. So we have the capability today, and we'll make sure that that continues to test the children around them, close contacts. So hopefully to avoid the necessity of quarantines largely throughout the school. So we think we have that capability today. It has been significantly effective. Um, and so we, we were continued to make sure that that works. And to the extent schools need additional supplies, we think we're in a good position to supply them as I've indicated uh, today. So at least for the foreseeable future, that's what we intend to do. We've shown that it can work. Last question comes from Patrick with Cairo 7. Go ahead, Patrick. Hey there, Governor, thanks for your time. Um, you've talked in general about the at-home test kits. I just wanted to ask you about your confidence level um, with Amazon, with Care Evolution, why you think allocating three and a half million test kits is appropriate. Clearly, that's a large majority of where these tests to the states will be going. Um, you know, as you know, rapid tests, keyword is rapid, getting those tests in hand. Why you think this system will be efficient? Uh, well, because Amazon delivers stuff to my house before we order it. It's a pretty amazing system. So I do have a high uh, a confidence in the ability of Amazon to do the transfer. They have a partner working with them that has done this in a variety of other contexts. So I, I do have high confidence in that. As far as the distribution, first, we wanted to make sure that we have additional testing to make sure that the Learn to Return program is fully uh, staffed with test kits. And as I've indicated, we're preserving 800,000 for that purpose. We already have a good stock. So that was our first priority. Once we fit that, then we looked at what's the best distribution network. This is the easiest, obviously, to get it to deliver to your home is the most convenient way to do it. But we also wanted to have some available through some other communities that don't and maybe use online a lot or want to have something in their community or have a connection with a provider who can help them, encourage them to get the test that's why we had three and a half million for the portal and one million for the local health organizations, schools, primary care providers. So that was our thinking on this. I think it's a, a well-balanced approach to this. 
Something to add, um, just for people's awareness, Washington State had participated in a federal pilot project in the fall, and that project served some of our rural counties in Washington State uh, to get them access to home tests. And that is how we uh, were essentially uh, taking that partnership and replicating it and expanding it statewide. So we do have confidence that Amazon and Care Evolution are going to be able to uh, help us get these at-home tests into the homes of Washingtonians across the state. Now, that being said, if a ship gets stuck in the middle of the Suez Canal at a 90-degree angle, I mean, there's you know there's just all kinds of is issues out there that you can't guarantee against, but we, we have high confidence in this. And I just wanted to emphasize, similar to all of the tools we're using to fight COVID, vaccine, masks, there's no one magic bullet. It's going to take a variety of testing solutions. You've talked about the at-home kits. We have mass testing sites. The federal government is standing up an additional web portal. We will have another mass test of testing FEMA site. It's going to take all of this to get through Omicron. So it's, it's not one magic bullet. It's all of these things together. Patrick, did you say you had a quick follow-up? I did have a follow-up. It's not related to COVID. Tomorrow is January 6th, Governor. I'm just curious how you would assess where we were and where we are now in the state with regards to political division. Thanks. Well, I'm just hesitating on whether I want to answer that because I have a lot to say about this. And I think I would rather say it tomorrow. Uh, I'll be in a AP a discussion tomorrow, and I have a lot to say about this. If, with your permission, let me say it tomorrow, if I can. I, I will just say it today. I have extreme concerns about the ongoing effort to continue a coup in this in the United States, and it is a continuing threat to democracy. We are at great risk. We were we've narrowly avoided a coup last time. And that effort is continuing. So I'm going to talk tomorrow about efforts to prevent that next time. Do you have any final words, Governor? No, I want to thank everybody for their efforts. Uh, our staff, Lacey and Nick, have been working really hard. And uh, I want to thank everybody in Washington for the work they've been doing. We're obviously not done this work. But again, I think that uh, we have an opportunity to save a lot of lives in the next several weeks. And I hope we all pitch in to help do that. So be well. Thank you.